who is in charge. David, before, was pleading with God that God spare this son. God says, the decision's already been made. But God, please, please. Fortunately, we don't do that, right? We never plead with God for anything. David pled with him. And when it didn't go that way, David understood why. And so he gets himself up, he puts himself back together, and there he is, king once again. That's kind of his way of saying, God, so be it. I understand. Not my will, but yours be done. Later on, two of David's kids, the brother rapes the sister. Good family life, isn't it? This would make a great soap opera. This is all within David's family. This man who could rule men, this man who could lead others into battle, this one who could charge all of his foes and win great battles, couldn't manage his own household. Why? Well, It's always hard when God's hand is upon you. When you are suffering the penalties of your own sin. Within all of the turmoil, though, when all of the things that have gone wrong, you have David writing most of the Psalms that we have. That's amazing, isn't it? If you were that hard pressed upon, if you saw that much destruction within your own family, if you saw everything that you love kind of falling apart, and the one thing in all the world that you wanted to do was build God his temple, and God says, sorry, <laughs> you're a warrior. That isn't going to happen. However, I'll let your son build it. That had to hurt too, didn't it? And yet... And yet, in all of that, God allows David to write down the thoughts of his heart. And in the Psalms, we have probably the fullest expression of our emotions anywhere in the Bible. If you want to see the whole gamut, from the highs to the lows, from the victories to the defeats, look in the Psalms. That was David's journal. That was the way that he wrote about what was happening in his own life, what he was feeling, what he was sensing, what his relationship with God was all about. And in this particular one, Psalm 51, we hear him acknowledging his sinfulness, that his sin is ever before him, that it is against God and God alone that he has sinned, recognizing that it might have been against Uriah, but ultimately it was against God. But the upside of all of this is that David experiences the forgiveness of God. Now, I would imagine that this would be, at least it would have been for me, a very difficult story to hear of all of David's sinfulness. And then it just got wiped away by God. But I would have had to say, but that's David. He's one of these pillars of faith. What else could happen? Or maybe we'd look at it the other way, and if God had not forgiven David, where would that have left us? Here was a man that did everything that God wanted him to do, that worshipped God day in and day out. Yes, he made mistakes. Yes, he sinned against God. Yes. But what if there had been no forgiveness? What if there had been no redemption? What if there had been no hope? Would we be able to be here this morning and say, but there's hope for me? There wasn't hope for David, but there's hope for me. I think it was in God's divine plan that we could see that this man of God was broken. But God restored. God redeemed. God offered his salvation. Now, ultimately, we know by skipping ahead, we can see this overarching story, this upper story of God, his redemptive story, wanting to restore this relationship with us. And we know that that redemption comes in Christ. 
this descendant of David, his great, 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 great grandchild, the Son of God. And in there comes the salvation that all of us are looking for. All of us want to belong, don't we? One of our deepest longings is to belong somewhere. I think that's why so many of us resort to genealogies. If only I can pinpoint where I came from, then I'll know who I belong to. Well, this is your story. This is where you came from. This is your descendant. This is the one that God has laid in your path to say, this is who you are. It's not just David's story. It's our story. And God lays it out there to teach us the very same lessons that he taught David. That even in the face of sin, you can be forgiven. So I would say out of all of this, it's the lessons of forgiveness that come through the strongest. Not obviously those around David forgiving him, but God forgiving David. And as such, David then was free to forgive others. Remember our Lord's Prayer that we said this morning. Forgive us our debts as we forgive what? Our debtors. There's a proviso, isn't there, isn't there? We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Don't hold the sins against others. And then go to God and say, but forgive me. When you come, I'll have to say, well, Saul. <laughs> Instead, be like David. Confess your sin. Lay yourself open before God so that there's room to receive his grace. Let's pray. Father, receive our confession, our brokenness. The spirit within us that cries out for your spirit. Let us be honest and truthful, confessing our sin, making room in our hearts once again for you. And there where you dwell, we shout with great joy, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, for forgiveness is of God. Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together above all. Let's join with the praise team. Let's stand and sing. Actually, let's go ahead and remain seated. Let's take up our offering while we're singing.